I'm going to hand it over to our co-founder and CTO, Barack Benligarai, and he's going to talk to you about Beacons and API 3. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. So, yeah, this workshop will start by me going over the API 3 solutions, like both about like what we built and then why we built it. And then in the second part, we will be doing a workshop around Beacons specifically. And in the middle, there will be a break where you can get some food um, and ask your questions if you have any. So I will start with the fundamentals, what an Oracle is, because I think this defines how you should design and build those stuff. Um, and then the most typical definition of an Oracle is it's something that gets off-chain data to your smart contract. And then this is factually correct, but then also not very useful of a definition, because if you think about like all the data in the world, Pretty much all of it is off-chain, so you're not saying much there. And then a lot of the off-chain data, you don't really care about. It's quite irrelevant to smart contract use cases. So I will make a small adjustment to the definition, which I don't think that anyone would disagree. And an Oracle gets useful data to your smart contract. And then even though this also doesn't sound like much, there are some properties of useful data that makes, like, that defines essentially how oracles should be designed. And then the properties of useful data is, uh, for one, useful data tends to be scarcely available. And what I mean by this is, it is generally not publicly available. And then there is a very obvious reason for this. Useful data by definition is data that someone needs, and then they would probably be wanting to pay for it, like if, if that is the only way to get access to it. And then this is why when someone has useful data, they don't make it publicly available. They make it only scarcely available. And then in practice, how this happens is the data gets productized. It's the most common case with the API providers where someone makes useful data scarcely available to their users uh, in return of some subscription fee. So they would be making the data available only through a period of time. And then what you would be able to do with that data would also be limited, most especially in regards to how you make it more available. Essentially, if you subscribe to an API, you're not allowed to make their data public because that's the scarce availability which disables them from monetizing that point of data. And then the other thing that you cannot do is you cannot resell their data because that, again, makes the data more available and then you're essentially eating into the API provider's business. And then the alternative of this is data silos. So this is generally what happens with enterprises is when they have some data, it is useful, people would like it, but it is too much of a hassle to productize it and monetize it. And then what happens is they would rather have the data wrote in a data silo than to have people who have used for it use it. So in either case, you can expect that useful data will not be made publicly available. And then since useful data is what you need with oracles, then you will have to work with this productized kind of data. And then yeah, I want to talk a bit more about the availability side of things. So data can be private, where only the data owner knows about it. So it may have not well exist. It can be public, so everyone knows about it. So an example to this is, blockchain data, for example, the, the data on the blockchain is publicly available, and then it is impossible to monitor because no one would pay for data that is available to everyone. So in terms of monetization, the scarce available part is the sweet spot here. So the data owners will want to keep their data only scarcely available so that they can keep monetizing it. And then what's interesting about the spectrum is that it only goes rightwards in that you can make private data public, you can make private data scarce available, you can make scarce available data public, but you can't go left. And then this implies that whenever you're using scarce available data, which is useful data, which is Oracle data, that data was at some point private. And then it was made a bit more available to be able to monetize it. And then in terms of trustlessness and security, this has an interesting implication in that at the time where the data was private, the data owner could have done anything they wanted with it. And then this requires you to trust the data owner with the integrity of the data. And then since this applies for scarce available data, which is useful data, which is Oracle data, 
whenever you're using an Oracle, no matter if it's first party or third party or whatever else, you will have to trust the data owners. So to recap the common properties of uh, data you get from oracles, for one, they have, they have an owner, they want to monetize it, which is why they productize it. And then this is the kind of data that you will want to get through an oracle because other kinds of data are useless in most cases uh, in the context that you want to use it. And then the second point is this kind of oracle data Guys, available useful data it requires you to trust the data owner because at some point it was private. So, and then this all indicates that, like, uh, a first party Oracle solution where it is the data owner which is also providing the Oracle service is, is sort of the optimal case because when you're receiving Oracle service, you don't know, you no longer need to trust them additionally about the oracle service integrity because you were already trusting them with the data integrity and then this doesn't require any additional security assumptions about the service so uh, and that it doesn't have a middleman but compared to that third party oracle solutions where there is a third party oracle agent in between the data owner and the data consumer that essentially buys the data from the api provider resells the data for the blockchain uh, project. And then here I'm not specifically talking about the third party Oracle nodes, but rather the project as a whole, because in most cases, the node pages don't get paid much, for example, compared to the whole market gap of the Oracle project, which is only made available or which is only made possible through the data that they receive from the API providers. The first problem here is these third party Oracles again, including the project, drain the majority of the generated value. And if you consider that the API provider's main goal was to monetize their data, and that's why they productized it, this doesn't really like coincide with their incentives. And then the second problem is, in addition to the required trust that you have to um, put into the data owners, now you also have to trust the intermediary level. And then the problem with this is, Essentially, this intermediary level, intermediate, intermediary layer of oracles are much less trustworthy than the data owners themselves. To the point that, if you look at like one of the third-party oracle solutions, their security uh, implementations will be around trying to prevent the third-party oracle layer from attacking, and it will just be assumed that the data owners will never attack. So, because the reason for this is that the trustworthiness of the data owners is much higher and the risk imposed by the third party oracle layer is, is much more significant to the degree that the data owner layer risks are negligible. And then there, there is a question we asked here. So whenever you have a good idea and then it is not implemented yet, you have to ask may there is a why there is a reason why this doesn't exist yet. And it's not only me that came up with a good idea here. Like if first party oracles are the obvious solution, why don't we have first party oracles right now? And pretty much all of the oracle solutions are based on third party oracles. And then here the problem is actually quite technical in that the main problem is the API providers, the data owners, they are not in a position to be able to provide oracle services because this requires a lot of know-how in blockchain, which they don't have. And then this is not their main business model. They are more uh, aimed towards monetizing their data on more traditional use cases. They don't see this as their main vertical, essentially. And they will not be investing either manpower or funds to make this possible. And also, even if they wanted to, for example, hire some blockchain developers to build these Oracle services for them, such people don't exist. But these, like, this is not doable scalably, which is why we currently depend on third-party Oracle node operators doing all the legwork and then, but as a result, this ends up causing the API providers to get pretty much none of the pie because uh, they are dependent on this middleman layer. And then, yeah, the, the technical solution to this is just to come up with an Oracle node that the API providers can actually operate, which is air node. So, um, yeah, if you want to learn more about it, I would recommend you to go out to the link. There are examples and stuff, and in the workshop, we will not be 
talking specifically about running an air node or how, how you would integrate an air node, et cetera, because those are more aimed towards the API providers, but it's all documented here. Um, and then the main property with air node is that it is maintenance free. So this is the primary thing that you want from a first party Oracle node is since the API providers don't have the capability uh, in terms of proficiency or resources to be able to maintain, actively maintain in the technical sense their Oracle service, then the Oracle node should essentially never break, which is what Air node is designed to do. Um, and then, yeah, another thing that it does is it allows the API provider to provide these Oracle services without having to trade cryptocurrency at all. And then this is also, again, a huge um, problem that API providers have at third party, or rather API providers um, not being able to provide their own Oracle services that with the existing solutions, they would have to trade cryptocurrencies to pay for transaction gas fees. And then this is just not uh, feasible in terms of like an accounting and legal sense. So they would rather not do that. But then AirNode is built in a way that they don't have to do it. And as I said, you can go to the conclusions and read about how this is achieved actually. But then this only allows a single API provider to provide Oracle services with their data, which is quite cool, but not exactly enough for what we are aiming for, because what we are aiming for is it's for all API providers to be able to do this. So that would mean we want hundreds of and thousands of first party oracles across many chains. And then one of the main bottlenecks for this kind of a thing is the integrations, because with the current way the Oracle solutions work, no one is incentivized to do, to do, to do their integrations because the API providers themselves, they know about oracles to do the integration and they certainly don't know that, so they will not be able to do that. And then the node operators are not really incentivized to integrate new APIs because like in most cases, since they don't exist yet in terms of an Oracle service, there's no demand for them. So there's a chicken and egg problem there. And then the central uh, Oracle project, essentially the core team of the Oracle project, they cannot scale up to integrate all these hundreds and thousands of APIs. This, and then these integrations also need to be maintained because if the API interface changes, you need to update your integration. So essentially for this to ever work, you will have to allow the API providers to maintain their own integrations, but then do this in a way that they don't need like, deep know-how into blockchains or what Oracle said even. So the first step of this is the Oracle integration specification, OIS. So this is a sort of an open API swagger kind of a thing where you can define an Oracle integration um, for a specific API. And then this essentially stand the, this essentially standardizes how integrations are made because if you think about existing third party based Oracle solutions, how you integrate an API to uh, an Oracle services, you develop an application that does that does that integration. And that means that you need to develop an application per API, per API, and then that doesn't really scale again, it becomes a bottleneck. So this is a much smoother standardized way of doing the integration. And then you'll have Chain API, which is an integration platform, which allows an API provider to create an Oracle integration specification. So essentially it handholds them through integrating their API uh, to an air node and then have them deploy the air node to serve multiple chains. And then this makes their API available to all chains without um, needing to have any uh, blockchain specific know-how because the, the whole platform is designed to uh, cater to API providers who are assumed to have, like they're assumed to be technical and then they're assumed to not know anything about blockchain. So this is yeah quite critical. Uh, and then API 3 Alliance is a good proof of this concept in that when it was uh, first announced, I, I think it had more than 125 API providers. I don't know how many more there are at the moment, but these are essentially API providers who have gone through all these steps and said that like one, we can do this all, we can do all this, like we can run our own first part of Oracle this way and two, we want to do this because this looks like a good idea um, 
for like how we would start providing Oracle services. And then a good portion of these already have first party Oracle nodes deployed in the form of air nodes. Um, so, and then this is like in, in terms of numbers, this far exceeds anything that's out there uh, from other Oracle solutions. But then also, if you think about the API provider operated node from other solutions, in most cases, they are either down because the API provider decided that they don't want to do this anymore and nobody knows about it really. So the, the integration still floats around in the documentation, but the service isn't there. And then another version of this is it is actually someone else running the Oracle node for the API provider. So it is not actually first party. Uh, it's not a first party service. You're, you're having to trust both the API provider and the entity that runs the node for them. So it doesn't have any of the advantages of first party Oracle. So it's only in name a first party Oracle. So yeah, this essentially proves the concept that we can actually make APIs available at scale um, for all smart contract use cases. And then this is mostly about how we are making API providers provide these services, but for developers, I guess they would care more about the protocols, which is how you would specify an Oracle request. And then it is very important to protocolize this stuff because one of the requirements that first part Oracle is that you can just phone them up and say, like, can you modify your node or can you deploy this additional application that now you also provide the service that I need? You need to be able to specify your request in a programmatic way, and their Oracle nodes should be able to fulfill that without you having to uh, communicate, them, communicate with them at all. And one, this helps with the first partners of the node because API providers will not want to uh, do that stuff, but then also it uh, removes this the bottleneck because otherwise, for example, if you are like a small blockchain project and you go to a large Oracle solution and then you ask for a customized solution, you will in most cases will not get a response even if your market cap isn't large enough. So, but then if you protocolize this step of uh, specifying your uh, customized request, then like, there is no reason for that to uh, provide you the service because it, is, it works just the same as any other uh, Oracle request, really. And then how these would be uh, designed is, so our approach is that the, the Oracle problem is actually the API connectivity problem in that what you want from Oracle is actually to integrate APIs to smart contracts. So an Oracle pr protocol if it can simulate what an API protocol does or did for traditional web, if we can do that on chain, then we are done. And then if you think about the traditional API architectures, there are two main ones, like the push ones and the pull ones. And then we have equivalently one push protocol and one pull protocol to cover all these use cases. So the first protocol is air node RRP, that's the request response protocol, where you ask a question to an Oracle and then the Oracle response as soon as possible. And then this is where you pull the data because you're essentially triggering them returning you to data. So th this would be why what you would use to integrate, for example, a traditional REST API because a REST API works as you make an HTTP request to it, it returns back to you, and then you're done. So this simulates the same interaction on chain. And then we have another protocol, which is the push protocol, air node publish subscribe protocol. Here, the, the request is actually push me this point of data when this specific condition is satisfied. And then in the traditional web world, this would be webhooks and again called publish subscribe in some cases. Um, but then in blockchain terms, I like to think of this as an Oracle and a keeper combined because normally how Oracles are used today for DeFi especially is you set up a live data feed using Oracles. And then there are some keepers that triggers some actions such as liquidations based on what the live data feed shows. And then you need two separate ecosystems of oracles and keepers. You need to incentivize them separately in terms of financial incentivization. And then overall, it's a much less cost efficient thing because what you actually want to do is to, for example, liquidate someone when certain conditions are met, but you have this intermediary oracle step in between. And then a push protocol um, essentially does away with that in that you can request from the Oracle 
to liquidate when, for example, the price hit this level. And then this would be the whole thing. You wouldn't need to maintain a live data feed because that's what you want to do at the end of the day anyway, to liquidate people when needed. So it allows you to do that stuff. But for example, we are also using KSP to set up data feeds too. Because if you think about it, a data feed needs to be updated when it's a certain percentage off from the actual value. And then this is the perfect scenario where you would need a push kind of a protocol. And then there's a third way of using the first party Oracle data, which is API science data. You probably know of this as the Coinbase Oracle. The thing is Coinbase Oracle was great, but then it didn't actually work. And then um, there, the main reason, because the, the main reason of that is it was an API specific implementation. So it was built specifically for Coinbase. It wasn't standardized. There wasn't a way to specify your request, um, or at least not that much. Like you could call different endpoints to get different kinds of data, but nothing more than that. Like you couldn't ask it to, for example, multiply the data returned by a thousand or take the logarithm of it, whatever. Like there are such use cases needed. Um, and then you can do that with Coinbase Oracles. And then it is only usable if you're fine with only using that as your sole data source, but then you can't decentralize it because that is the only thing available. So what we do here is the Oracle integration specifications already uh, provide this standardized way of uh, specifying your request. So we already got that part covered. If you created an OS for an API, then you will be able to uh, make all these custom requests. And then also, since all these API providers have already deployed air nodes, these air nodes can be used as the backend that serves the signed data. And then this means that when we make, again, these hundreds and thousands of APIs available as first party oracles, they will also be able to provide services similar to the Coinbase Oracle, but it will be much greater because uh, you will end up having many of them so you can aggregate from them. And then you will be able to specify requests in a more granular way. So, and then, yeah, we have a call on Friday by Ashar, how to use any web API from a smart contract. So this essentially demos Aeronaut RRT, which we will not do in this workshop, but it is at Gravity stage Friday 3.40. And then the ways to receive Oracle services. So I talked about these protocols, but as a developer, do you want to use these protocols? Probably not. And this is because they are quite powerful because they are low level. And as you know, in programming, if something is powerful, in most cases, it is easy to do mistakes with, and then the mistakes will be costly. And then if a lot of people want to do the same thing with the protocol, you probably need to build a higher level product with it and then provide that instead of asking them to build with the bare protocol. But essentially, this is something that you can do if you need to do something very original with the thing. And then what we do with it doesn't cover your needs. You can use these RRP and PSD protocols in their bare form. Alternatively, you can use monolithic turnkey solutions. So these are what data fees are generally. Like decentralized data fees are these. They essentially say that like this is the e PSD price. Don't ask anything about it. Like just trust this data feed and use it in your application which is the general way of doing things today. And then what we're proposing with Deacons is the third one. You can build on modular Oracle primitives. So this is something between the bare protocol and the turnkey solution. So this is essentially a building block for the turnkey solution that you can use individually or you can build your own solutions using that. So, and then the yeah, Deacons are not the only kind of these primitives, but um, yeah, we will only be talking about beacons because this is supposed to be the DeFi track and people care about data feeds mainly. So what is a beacon? A beacon is a live data feed primitive. And it has some desirable qualities versus it is first party, meaning that it is powered by an air node um, that is operated by the API provider themselves. So you can, the only person or the only entity that you need to trust with using the data feed is the data provider themselves, which is the most trust-minimized case anyway. And then they are 
this is the same reason for transparency. You know exactly where your data comes from. It comes from the standpoint of this API when you call it the these parameters. So you can tell that uh, very transparently and then compare that to the other decentralized Oracle solutions. You don't know, like, you don't, in most cases, you don't even know what APIs are used, let alone what endpoints are used and what parameters are used. And these are cost efficiently secure because now you don't need the third party middleman. Because the problem is, so normally how third party oracles work is you, you have multiple third party oracle nodes, they get the data from the API and it gets aggregated, and then you use the aggregated data. And then the only cost of this is not the gas cost, obviously there is an additional gas cost for this, for doing this, but then also you need to incentivize these third party oracle nodes to one, so that they find this worthwhile, and then two, they find it more profitable to provide the service rather than attack. So you're actually paying a lot to the third party Oracle in the intermediate layer, and then this is what we call as the middleman tax in the white paper. But here, this is much more cost efficient, and then in addition to that, even more secure. And then this makes it scalable in that you can set up a lot of beacons uh, with first party Oracle nodes quite easily. As, uh, for example, it, this is actually something that is good for us, the APIT DAO, and that we can set up beacons quite easily, as you will see in the workshop. There. We just set up a lot of beacons in no time for this hackathon. Um, but then if you think about how third-party oracles, Oracle nodes work, you will have to find a lot of third-party oracles, and it is essentially a, uh, yeah, an exercise in cat herding, getting all these individual third-party oracles integrated to the APIs, and you set up the data fees, and you essentially manage the incentivization and all that stuff versus here you're just programmatically using the protocol setting up the beacon and you're done so it's quite easy and again we have documentation for beacons here if you want to check it out but then yeah this is not all we also have the apis so the idea is that if you're using apis for apps in the traditional web development world you need the api for that so this is supposed to be um, yeah, an equivalent of APIs. So these are essentially Oracle decentralized Oracle services built on top of beacons. And then this makes it more decentralized and transparent compared to the other turnkey solutions in that these are not monolithic. So these are obviously more transparent because when you are using a data feed, you again know exactly what APIs you're using, what endpoints they're calling, and then what, what parameters they're using. If an API goes down, you see it immediately, like if you're using a seven API, the API, for example, and that one of them is misreporting, now you know that that API is probably not very reliable. But if you would be using a third party Oracle network, you wouldn't know what API fails, at what frequency, and what they do. And if they are taken out of the data feed, you know nothing about this. But with a DAPI, you can see all that as a user. And then it's more decentralized because, um, well, these more monolithic turnkey solutions, they tend to be, for example, aggregating on a side chain or off chain. And essentially the governance of these, um, so for, for one, when you're aggregating on a side chain or off chain, that's essentially a permission network. So um, essentially the, whoever is managing that network or uh, deciding who gets on that network decides on what data sources will be used in that uh, data feed. So that's a point of centralization. And then also, if as the user, for example, you want to left out some data sources, you have no chance because it is the monolithic data feed you use or you don't use it. But with beacon-based APIs, you can pick and choose beacons and set up your own data feed, for example, if you don't want to use a specific data feed, specific API. Um, so yeah, this is, so we have both protocols, the uh, Oracle primitives, and then also the turnkey solutions in the form of the APIs. And finally, I want to talk about our coverage feature. So, you know, Oracle projects are quite lacking in security in that the, the idea is to build as secure of a data feed as you can and then hope that it doesn't fail. And then if it fails, there is no Fail safe, fail safe mechanism. But in fact, if you're quantifying 
how much value you are locking, for, for example, if you're both thinking about your TDL, you should also be able to quantify how much more funds you can secure because it is not infinite. At some point, your data feed will break. So you need to be able to quantify that level of security. And then it also has to be comprehensive. So if you look at the game theory based um, security solutions that uh, Oracle projects try to come up with, in most cases, they don't protect against all kinds of failure. And in most cases, uh, this is to do with governance because yeah, the problem is governance is the highest level, hi highest, highest level layer in the whole solution, and that it is, in most cases, off chain and done central in a centralized way. So, so you're trusting that centralized governing body, in addition to all the Oracle nodes uh, reaching their consensus, and that most Oracle solutions don't protect against this centralized governing body tailing in governance and then this already happened uh, for example by feeding gold price instead of silver and then for example the oracle notes there they're all in consensus because they were all asked to deliver the gold price but asking them to deliver the gold price is actually a governance problem so the, the actual solution to this is or at least what we come up with is uh, providing a quantifiable level of coverage saying that when you're using our oracle service if it fails, uh, and then there will be a policy just laying out all the reasons that or the ways that it can fail. If it fails, and then you suffer losses, then you cover your losses. And then this essentially is about all of the levels that a failure can happen, because it um, because it, it is not a part of the protocol. It is implemented as in a way, a subjective oracle, a dispute resolution protocol, or a third party arbitrator that decides on if this claim will be paid out or not. And then isolating that from the oracle protocol makes it possible to protect against all kinds of failures. So, yeah, this was mostly a DeFi focused uh, run through of our products. So, in DeFi, most people uh, want to have data feeds and then they want to have secure data feeds for a lot of various, various data types uh, in a scalable way in that they want it on this chain or that chain. And then when you have the third party based uh, decentralized Oracle solutions, a lot of the use is feasible to provide Oracle services with. But then this, uh, these beacons and beacon based the APIs come as a solution to all that. And then the coverage on top of that allows you to uh, essentially cut close with the kind of oracle services that you will want to use because with the, when you don't have any when you have this kind of a security mechanism you have to make sure that the oracle service that you need actually never breaks and that it is very difficult to find data types where you can set up a date set up an oracle service that will never break so for example if you think about i don't know outcomes of esports Games. So the APIs for those, even though you use the best three APIs for that, and then there are not many APIs for that, they may not be very reliable. And then if your solution depends on the Oracle service to never break, then you will never be able to build a high value service on top of that. But when you have insurance, this suddenly makes all these less reliable kinds of Oracles usable in higher value uh, applications. And the idea here is that the insurance premiums that uh, the coverage provider uh, collects should um, outside the payouts, and then this like this wouldn't be a, a loss scenario, even though if it fails. Sometimes the Oracle service provider wins, and the use case ends up being enabled, which where it wasn't enabled by third-party oracles before. So, yeah, this was my <laughs> presentation. I think we will take a break now for food and then continue with Dave running through the beacons once more. And then there will be a workshop about how to use beacons because we set up these beacons for the hackathon. There are 20 beacons on four testnets. And then we will be running through this project where you can easily deploy and read from these beacons to build projects. So if you have any questions, you can ask now and I can answer it. 
from the stage or you can come talk to us um, and then ask about, for example, if you have any specific Oracle services that you're looking for or if you didn't understand about the, about the presentation. Otherwise, yeah, we can move on to the break.